tell you that I think is just super fascinating. But it has to do with the next slide, which I think shows you that uh, how, how we do, what we do when we make a collapsible tube. Now this would be, say, like a, an aluminum uh, collapsible tube that you put toothpaste in or ointment or salve or something. Or you could do this with lead. Or let's say a battery case that's made out of zinc would be made the same way. But let's suppose we want to make a collapsible tube with a, with a screw cap on it. What we do is we have a die cavity that looks like this. This is a die cavity. And we're going to put into that a blank, which will be a cylindrical piece of material looks like that. We have at the bottom now uh, a hole in the die so that we can have a forward extrusion that is going to occur down at this part of the die, right? And as it comes out, we could actually have a punch on this is the punch, the piece that's going to uh, run into this piece of metal. We can have a punch with a pilot, this being the pilot, the appendage on the end, long enough so that it would perforate the material and make a hole in the piece that's extruded this way. We could also thread the sides of the, this uh, die so that it would flow into the threaded section and we would have it already threaded. And we put the little, say let, it's an aluminum piece, an aluminum blank in about the size of a quarter or the size of a 50 cent piece, and we push this ram down on top of it at a very, very high velocity. And what happens is the metal splashes, just like this was made out of water. The metal splashes up the side of the tube very, very rapidly. And of course, it forms forward as well. It's a forward and a backward extrusion. And it splashes up the side. If we uh, relax or pull back the punch and the pallet that's on the end of it, then we have this a collapsible tube sitting in this die. If we had it threaded at the bottom, then it's going to be screwed in there. But if we blew an air blast just on one side of this, it would unscrew to the hole and be blown to one side. And at the same time, we'd bring up another little uh, piece of aluminum that would sit there and the punch would come down. And if we had a, let's say, a reciprocating toggle press, it would go like And each time it goes down, then we have a collapsible tube. So they're very cheap commodities that we can make. Well, I, I want to tell you what I think is a fascinating story about this because uh, it, there is a capability out there of producing a coal material beyond most people's imagination. And I was lucky enough in 1953 to get in on the origin of this. Although the real story started back in the 19th century when, when, people, when men wore collar buttons. I'm sure you don't know what a collar button is, do you? Anybody know what a collar button is? I don't think so. Well. Uh, Men used to wear detachable collars all the time uh, for lots of reasons. I guess one reason is you could always have a clean collar and not change your shirt. Uh, <coughs> but the collars were generally stiff and you wore a shirt with just a little band around it and there were two buttonholes and you had this collar button which was like a washer on one end with a fusion and a little ball on the other end. A and you could stick the, the collar button through the hole and then stick the uh, detachable collar on it and, and it attached and that was the way a lot of men wore their collars in those days. Well, a man uh, named Hooker actually invented, uh, actually was a patent attorney. He, uh, he stole the invention from a man named Lee. Lee actually invented it, but uh, he invented a method of making that collar button by a forward reverse extrusion, a forward backward extrusion. And, and we know about that. It's in the patent literature. And so from that came the collapsible toothpaste tube. But we have a problem. Anything that flows backwards now uh, can only flow backwards as far as, as far back as the punch is long. And there's going to be a limit on how long we can make the punch. There's something called a crippling ratio. If you had a, a real long bar, like this bar, and you push at it on the top, it's going to tend to buckle it on the side. And so how long can we make a piece? What's the aspect ratio we can have that will have a stability to it and say we can operate within the elastic range of the metal. It turns out to, to be about seven to one. So we couldn't make a collapsible tube any longer than seven times as long as its diameter. But wouldn't it be nice if we could, by impact extrusion, make a forward extrusion, like the end, like I've shown you in some of the slides, or like the end of the collapsible tube, and have the material just continue to come out so that instead of being limited now by the punch that I'm using, I am not limited at all, that I can make a long, long tube. And in England, there was a man named Archibald Bridge who decided that uh, he'd like to do that. He knew something about the hooker process. 
and he worked for Crit Lux for Limited, and they made uh, finestral sections, triple track, uh, sash sections, door, door jam sections, all sorts of extrusions, and they did them hot. And he decided he'd like to do them cold, and he would like to do it by impact extrusion. So he set up his, his outfit to make an extrusion, and he caused his press to go real fast, and it rammed into the piece of metal, and it broke the die. And every time he tried it, it broke the die. And the Second World War was over, and we were the victors, and so we were going into Germany taking what we wanted. Uh, whether you liked that or not, that's what we did. We were victors. And one of the things, and the British were doing that, and the Ministry of Supply was directed to get whatever industry wanted, or universities, or research people. And Archibald Bridge told him, I understand that the Germans are making high-velocity extrusions. I want the fastest press they've got. And they brought it back to him. A and he assembled it, and he put in it a little billet, and he ran it up pretty fast, and he tried to extrude a tube, and he got a tube that was only about an inch long. And when he tried to make it longer by going faster, he broke a die. Now, when anything breaks that's metallic, it's obviously the metallurgist's fault, right? So he went to the metallurgist and said, something's wrong with the die, make me a better one. And the metallurgist made him a better die. He tried it again, and he, sure enough, he, he got a little bit faster, and he made a little bit longer tube, and that gave him a lot of encouragement. And he tried it a little bit faster, and he broke the die. And he said to the metallurgist, uh, look, make me a better die <laughs> so I can go faster. And the metallurgist said, I can't make you any better die. And he couldn't. And so he gave him the best die. He had given him the best die he had, but he had a spare die. And he still had a lot of velocity on the press. So he put a billet in this, in this uh, die set, and he put a remote control on the press. He set the machine so it's going to go at the very fastest velocity it possibly can. Everybody went in the other room to push the button, and the press coughed and advanced very rapidly. And they went in the room and had a, a tube that was 20 feet long. Now, I have seen this. I'm not telling you a dream because I worked for a number of years on this. And I have in, in this particular plant at Critter Lux for Limited in England watched them extrude 80 foot long irrigation tubes in three tenths of a second. Okay? You, you stand there on the bed and the press, horizontal press over on the side and it goes <coughs> and you look and there's a tube. If you stood in front of it, you'd be a donut, right? Uh, <laughs> It, it, it is really very, it goes very, very rapidly. <laughs> now, you should become intrigued with this, and you should want to say, want to know, well, gee whiz, if all of this is so, uh, what could I possibly, what could possibly be happening in the metal to allow you to do this? Now, I don't really know. I think I know, and I've put it in print, but the people that read it say, got to be wrong. Something's wrong with it. And in, when I give you my next lecture, which is going to be having to do with uh, strengthening mechanisms and non-ferrous materials, you will see why they think I'm wrong. And you know, I sort of agree with them. But there's one thing I do know, because I've watched it. In a back extrusion, when you make a collapsible tube, the metal just splashes like water. It really does. And we utilize that deformation velocity a lot of ways. In fact, if we want to make a real deep shell, out of a very, very difficult material to fabricate. What we do is we put sheet explosive over top of, a, of it as it's pinned over top of a die, and we detonate that thing, and it explodes. The explosion drives the metal at a very high velocity into this container. It moves like water. And what does that mean, move like water? It means it's moving without strain hardening, probably, for one very, very small interval of time. Well. Maybe that's so, maybe that isn't so, but we certainly use the high-velocity deformation process all the time to do a lot of different things. I'll describe one more aspect of that that I, I suppose you know about already, but maybe you don't. But there's something called a shaped charge liner. And the shaped charge liner in most people's language means nothing. But if I ask them if they knew what a bazooka was, they'd say, oh yes, that's something you use to knock a tank out with. In the 1800s, an uh, army officer found out that if you, if you had a, a piece of high explosive and you put over a block of stone or concrete and detonated it and make a hole in the concrete, let's just say it's five inches deep. He took the same piece of explosive and carved a cavity in it and put it over this block of concrete and detonated it, it would make a hole in it that was, let's say, 10 inches deep. 
just because the concavity focused the explosive forces. And then, about 1937, uh, people found out that if you line that cavity with a metal, what would really happen is that that, let's say it's conical concavity, that conical concavity will turn wrong side outwards and be driven forward as a jet, and that jet will move oh, at velocities like 38,000 feet a second. And so it travels through the air as this very thin stream of metal going very, very rapidly. And so it could hit, let's say, armor plate in a tank and punch a tiny little hole. But did you ever have a rock hit your windshield and then it makes a tiny little hole in the front, spawns a big piece off the back, goes rattling around, wiping out machinery, killing people and doing all sorts of things. Well, that sounds horrible if you want to talk about warfare, but we use those things. That's what we tap open hearth furnaces with these days. They don't want anybody climbing up in that hot hole and trying to dig that stuff out. We just run a shape charge up in there and touch a button and psh, got a hole in it and the metal comes rolling out. And we use it to open up oil sands. Uh, we make Christmas trees of these things. We put them down in an oil well where the oil has, the residue is plugged up to oil sands and we fire these and it punch little holes through the casing and back into the sands to open up the oil well. So they, so they have good uses. And we use this business of high velocity deformation now to make a lots of things. It's a coal defamation process that we use it in. Well, we have still a couple of more ways that we, we should consider in, uh, in coal working the material to put it in final form. And the most useful one, I suppose, and the one that allows us to do the highest tolerance on almost anything is machining. <coughs> and I just wanted to show you that when you machine a piece, if you have, a, a, say, a tool working in a shaper, a milling machine, a lathe, it doesn't make any difference. If we have a tool and we are cutting a piece of work, it's getting a chip off. Now, what you have occurring at this particular point now is exactly what you have in the stress-strain uh, development on a tensile machine. That is to say, you're loading the material up plastically, uh, excuse me, you're loading it up elastically, then it is flowing plastically, and we're continuing it to flow until we rupture the material and that says it cleaves away from the workpiece. If you didn't have your tool ground right for the work you were doing and it was a ductile material, what you would find out is that you would plow into the material, you'd elastically deform it, you'd plastically deform it, but not enough to cause it to cleave and so you wouldn't have a chip to come off, you'd have this long ribbon of metal that would pile up on the tool post and give the machinist a fit and so then he learns to to grind his tool so he gets more deformation in the piece of a type that will cause the material to hit its rupture point and it breaks off into little chips. Swaging produces round rod and achieves a greater reduction in area in one pass than wire drawing. Forward extrusion advances material through the die in the same direction as the punch. In backward extrusion, the material advances in the opposite direction. Aspect ratio of punches, punch length divided by punch diameter, generally is limited to seven or less to prevent breakage. High velocity impact extrusion causes metals to flow or splash as if they were liquid. In machining, the cutting tool imparts stress on the workpiece to deflect the chip first elastically, then plastically, ultimately causing rupture. And so, what we see is that we have now a method of doing shaping or developing shapes by cold deformation. Lots of different processes, some of them very similar to hot working processes that will give us a finished product of, of the materials we want. But we will do this with ferrous and non-ferrous materials. And in the ferrous materials, we always have the advantage of heat treating the part if in the operation we had recrystallization, let's say. We can heat treat it and make it strong again. If the strengthening mechanism is coming from just plastic deformation, we need to understand that. And so,